We've been talking about taking ownership of the earth. Thank you. I've got one person that knows what we're talking about. <laughs> Out of hundreds and hundreds, one person said, yeah. And, and I hope that you're taking charge of your part of the earth. See? I can only help you take charge. I am not responsible for your part of the earth. I shared with you years ago, Ken Copeland standing on the, the, the platform at, at Rayma in South Africa. And he said, he said, the church in South Africa needs to understand that the church in America is not responsible for what goes on in South Africa. The church in South Africa is responsible for it. Similarly, the churches in West Virginia... D.C. and so on, are not responsible for what goes on in Northern Virginia. The churches in Northern Virginia are responsible for what goes on in Northern Virginia. What we allow is allowed. Oh, let me go over here. I know, I know you're absorbing it. I know. That's the, but I want, you to, I want you to understand something. That we've allowed too much. We've allowed too much. And I'm not just talking politically. It, it ends up politically. You know, well, you've got to be politically correct. I am. I'm the most politically correct person you ever will meet. Yes. I will not be dictated to by them. I'm going to give you what the truth is. And if you don't like it, well, that's fine. If they don't like it, I couldn't care less. Bottom line is, what does the Word of God say? What is the order and structure that God has determined His people are to live by? And we are to ensure that we enforce that in every area of our lives. We talked about taking the schools. I'm trusting that the Lord is going to be dropping into the heart of somebody, some young person, a burning desire, irrespective of consequences. I mean, how many times can they suspend you from school? Okay? And when, they, when you've got 800 kids suspended from school, do you think you'll get the attention of, of Channel 7? You'll get, the, you'll get the attention. And they don't like you praying around whatever? Pray around it. Well, they kick you off the... That's fine. Then we'll pray at the front gates. And when we finish praying at the front gates, we're going to march around the school seven times until those walls fall down. Yes. I have a constitutional right, and so do you, to pray in school. And pray for all of those that are lost. Father, that they come into a right relationship with you. Yeah, that's praying. It's not, oh God, bless our headmaster. Forget the headmaster at the moment. You've got to pray for, you've got to pray for the kids that you interact with. They are having such challenges at home, and they don't have any answers. Pray for your family. God, make my mom and dad godly people. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. I better move on. Let's have a look. And then we started, because remember this, I'm responsible and you are responsible for your part of the earth. It starts with you. It extends to your immediate family. What goes on in your family, you're allowing. I've got a voice over here that was a voice in the wilderness. Hallelujah for the voice in the wilderness. But you see, the bottom line is what goes on in my house, if I allow it, I'm responsible for allowing it because I've got authority over that area. Yes, I raise my kids the way I want to. Don't tell me, just like we saw on the, on the video a couple of weeks back, don't tell me how I've got to run my kids at home, how I'm supposed to educate my kids. I know how to educate my kids, but make certain that you do know how to educate your kids. And don't go along in the, under the subterfuge of this is, this is Christian homeschooling. If you, with respect, if, if you don't have the educational level to educate your kids, don't play games with their education. It's their future. Like any good leader, you, you cannot take the people, or you, the people cannot be expected to rise above the level of your ability. I've got great expectations here. I want to see everybody casting devils out. I want to see people with the gifts operating. I want to see it. I want to see it. You're not going to sit like a bump on the log in, in living faith. God added you here because there's stuff that God wants to do through us. Amen? So we started having a look. If you remember, we were looking back there 
at uh, Luke chapter 4. Uh, well, no, let's move on from Luke chapter 4. Let me go to, to the one that's, um, that's closer at hand. And that was the story, I think it's Luke chapter 5, uh, with Jesus and, and the guys that he's in the house. And the guys bring the man with the palsy, right? And they can't get in the door and they can't get in the window. And the only way they could get in was to put him up on the roof. I think the guy on the litter had to have more faith than the guys that were carrying him because they're going to let him down. Oh, my goodness. Can you imagine that? All right? They, they, we got no record of ropes or anything like that. They just let the guy down. But it was their faith because it, we're told that when Jesus saw their faith. But the interesting thing is that their faith didn't get him healed. They had to take their faith and get their faith in connection with the divine power. And separating faith and divine power was a thing called roof. Yeah? And they took time and effort. But they removed the thing that separated their faith from the end result that the, power, the divine power would bring. Yes? And so we talked a little bit about this. Each one of us could have, could have a roof. Something that separates us from the divine power. Because I want you to understand, it wasn't just faith that got that man healed. Jesus saw their faith, but they had to bring their faith into contact with the divine power that would produce the healing. So it's always the story throughout the earth in every situation when you as a child of God are going to work together with God. It's God and sons in operation. We are going to have to believe for his divine power to come in and do something. Are we all right? Okay. So I made this statement in closing last week, and it was this. For healing to be experienced, for healing... To be experienced, we're talking about healing because there are two main areas where Christians battle today. One is healing of their bodies, and the other is finances. All right? That's where the enemy dictates. We've got to have control of that. God has given us the ability to have control of it. But we've got to understand that control is not a, a manipulative kind of thing. It is a spiritual assertion. We take the power of our faith, and we apply it to this situation, knowing that God is going to watch over His Word and perform it. So we've got to make a demand on that healing power. A lot of people, and we, we'll, we'll look at this in a minute, but a lot of people come into meetings like this and they leave untouched. Now, if you leave here untouched today, I think you need to get born again. You need No, seriously. Because there's something that's preventing you from receiving from God. I mean, you don't have to do all the weird things that we do. But we enjoy being weird. We enjoy it. God created us. You see, he called us a peculiar people. So I know what the word means. Don't write me letters. Okay. Now, for the healing to be experienced, a demand has got to be made on that divine power. Every time. Every time, I've got to make a demand on it. When I'm laying hands on the sick, I make a demand on it. Go across with me to um, Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, and put that up there for us, please, Donna. And this is what I want us to do on the second point. The first point was this, right? You've got to make a demand on the, on the anointing. You've got to make a demand on it. If you don't make a demand on it, the anointing can be present. You can be in need. And you never get healed. You never get touched. 